I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at CrowdScout, um, and this is Alex, our Director of Customer Success. Um, let's just take a, a minute or two, and we will be right with you. We're really excited about this webinar. So as I started to say, um, we're going to be doing a series of these, uh, hopefully pretty frequently, and it's a great chance to connect with folks who are already CrowdScout customers, as, as well as folks who are um, you know, just, just getting uh, involved in this stuff. Yeah. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. <clears throat> Guys, this is our first time using a new webinar service and I truthfully am just learning how to get under the hood of the car. Just give us one moment. All right. So today, Alex, you know, we're going to talk about how to segment our audience. And what we really mean broad strokes is how do you actually market to folks? And when we say market, we're really talking about the kind of work that our customers do, folks who are trying to move issues, whether it's at a ballot box or moving a bill through a state house or really even just trying to you know, change hearts and minds. Um, how do you do that in an effective way? And I think that a common misconception is that segmentation, split testing, um, you know, drilling down on audiences in ways that are really complex, that that is the work for groups with multi-million dollar marketing budgets. And of course, that is something that is often few and far between in the advocacy and political space. And so, you know, we're really here to say it doesn't have to be something that only people with multi-million dollar marketing budgets can do. Um, but I think that we can start out by agreeing that there's no question that targeting is crucial. Um, and the stats really back this up. You know, about 75% of people report being really frustrated by being inundated with content across cha channels. You know, more than 70% of people have said that they consciously prefer content that's tailored to them, um, which I actually find kind of weird because I feel like the sort of um, the common misconception is that people want to have you know, cookies turned off and don't want to be fed tailored content. Right. But actually a, a stat that someone on our team actually shared with me um, a while ago is that most people who do do things like turn on increased privacy settings, turn cookies off, within a few days they turn them back on because people want to receive personalized content. And it makes sense that they do because I just learned this stat the other day and it's kind of crazy. An average American is served something like 10,000 advertisements daily. Um, that's up from, you know, 5,000 just a couple of years ago and, you know, it's only increasing. So it's, it's really hard for consumers. And when I say consumers, I mean voters and audiences that our folks are trying to influence. It's really hard for consumers to even cut through and figure out what it is they're interested in and even harder and more essential, um, you know, for, for folks in our space to be conscious about segmenting their audiences to do that, to do that targeting. Um, so I'm going to share some tips uh, as we go through here. Um, and then after I do that, Alex is going to sort of hop into the platform a couple of times because um, I think that'll um, give people a, a, a real sense of how to actually do this work of, of awesome audience segmentation. Um, and you know, we also encourage you to be interactive with us, um, to ask us questions as we go through this. Um, so uh, our colleague Scott is gonna help us um, sort of field questions, um, but do please ask questions as we go along because the, the best kind of webinar is one that is interactive. Um, so let's go ahead and, and get started. So. How do you break through the noise um, with effective audience targeting strategy, of course. Um, so let's walk through a couple of tips as we, as we think about this. 
So the first thing that I would say that, that I find, and, and Alex, do jump in here. I, I think you probably find this too. Alex is um, onboarded and can, done trainings of hundreds of our customers. And so she, she's really the person who's, who's in the field with folks, is that one of the biggest challenges for people is that they know that they need to target effectively, but they don't really truly know their audience. Um, and what I mean by that is I think that, you know, people have really been attracted to kind of the world and the allure of big data, which is wonderful. And certainly in the advocacy space, as well as in the political space, there's a lot of data that you can go out and buy. Um, but say a typical voter file might have thousands of fields. I mean, what do you think? Yeah, like multiple thousands of fields. Of columns that are just really often not that relevant right. to someone who is trying to move a single issue at a state house. Um, you know, I, I read some statistics about how most campaign pros, even up to the, the federal level on the political side, maybe come back to like 20 or 30 columns from a from a typical voter file. So things like demographic data, like, um, you know, is this person um, single, married, uh, what are their voting patterns? Those can be really helpful columns of, of data as you help to sort of sort and drill down on your audience, certainly. But in fact, you know, people often, I think, think, oh, I need to like start targeting people based on, um, you know, presence of a uh, garden magazine <laughs> subscription, right? And and actually that kind of old, um, kind of early aughts idea of like, how do I target the um, latte drinking Volvo driver? What we actually find in the political and advocacy space is that um, there's really only so much that you can do to differentiate among audiences in a way that's meaningful. So one of my favorite statistics is that in last cycle during 2016, we had 17, um, you know, primary candidates on the Republican side. And of those folks, um, virtually all of them among a handful of candidates actually looked the same way. They had right. the same demographic profile in terms of subscriptions, in terms of, um, in terms of things like um, demographic uh, points like income or otherwise. And so in, in essence, what you saw is that that kind of targeting was actually not very effective right. um, because a Rubio voter didn't look different from a Kasich voter. And we see that among issues too. You know, um, I come from this world, this is the work that I used to do. And we often will talk about knowing an audience in terms of, of who's a limiter. So who is a person who would be with you on an issue but for this thing or but for this way that you're talking to them. Um, and so I think figuring out what the day of the of the day items or attributes are that are actually meaningful to your cause really matters. So, for instance, um, you know, if you're in West Virginia and you're working in a in a place that has been a, a, a town or um, region that was traditionally, you know, a coal mining area, people there probably have very strong views on clean coal, right? So um, the way that you sort folks there and learning what their attributes are, something like um, issue position on the environment or energy policy probably is a super meaningful attribute to sort folks there um, in a way that it might not be in Berkeley, California, because probably virtually uh, everyone there has a, a totally different view. So figuring out, you know, um, in some regions, it might be levels of religiosity. In some areas, uh, your audiences must be, um, you know, really broken down by really hot button issues like um, the Second Amendment or, um, you know, other issues issues that we could sort of get down a rabbit hole on. But I think that as we bring that back, I think it's important to realize that the best data about your audience is the data that you're collecting yourself. So I often joke about the, the ABCs of data, you know, always be collecting, but the customers that we see that are really effectively targeting audiences are people who are um, really relying upon the data they're collecting rather than on the third party data that is available to them.
Right, exactly. And it's super important for a lot of our customers. And like Lucy was saying, you know, using that smaller data set, really figuring out who your target audience is by the data that they're collecting, whether it's online data or offline data and being able to sort of aggregate that data in one place and figure out, you know, what your next strategy is or figuring out who your audience is and how you want to target them. That's a, that's a great point. So I think that targeting folks based on your ongoing interactions with them is so important. So, you know, when Barack Obama was elected president the second time, people were talking a lot about um, the fact that he was, his campaign, the cave they talked about, was targeting people based on behavioral data. And when we talk about sort of the whole essence of your audience, whether it's five people or five million people, we really want to realize that issue and demographic and it data is really only half of the story about your audience. So um, for instance, maybe you're working in a district where you're um, trying to target likely voters who are um, Democrats who voted in two of the last three elections who also um, you know, have children. Um, but that targeting is so much more powerful if you're targeting folks based on your ongoing interactions with them. So suddenly you can start to direct ads or outreach to folks in a way where you are targeting those same Democrats who voted in two out of the last three elections who also have um, interacted with your website in the past hour or who, um, uh, you know, we're door knock to, or maybe you're door knocking to people that you know are active on social media. So really having that 360 view online and offline of your audiences, I think is, is essential to realize that your audience segments go so far beyond just um, someone's race, gender, political preference, um, issue tags, but that your content is really keying off their behavior. So if you have someone who is, you know, really responsive, online, you know, probably shouldn't be sending them a ton of direct mail or vice mm -hmm. versa. And that goes back to the kind of the, the, the caring and feeding of your data that we started talking about when we were talking about why targeting is so crucial. You want to target people and deliver that personalized content because you don't want them to get fatigue from your own content. Mm -hmm. um, you don't want to be the, the email that hits their inbox where they're hitting unsubscribe um, or dropping your mail in the trash can because you want to become a trusted brand where they know that the content you're delivering them is relevant to them. Um, so I think that, you know, that, that really also gets down to playing where they play. You know, we see a lot of folks sometimes make the mistake of trying to force their audiences to consume content in ways that just are not natural to them. Um, so, you know, not everyone in your demographic and depending on um, what sort of outreach you're working on, whether it's electoral or otherwise, actually, in the issue moving space, actually many of our most activated demographics are um, older or you know, may not participate in the same sort of channels that, that other a younger millennial demographic would. So don't force your audiences to consume in ways that aren't natural to them. Um, driving people to your channels is really smart, but make their village green your village green. Um, I think that also broad cloth, we do know that different demographics are much more or less likely to, for, to respond to different channels. So when you're just starting out with a segmenting strategy, this is a really good opportunity actually to explore industry trends about where your target groups live in terms of content consumption. So for instance, you know, both BCG and Nielsen um, do annual surveys where they talk about how people consume content. And it's, it's really interesting and surprising. For instance, you know, certain subsections of young males tend to be really responsive to ads served to them on radio. <laughs> um, and so, you know, you, you can rely upon, upon some of those, um, those tools at your disposal as you kind of use it as a, as a bridge to figuring out those kinds of first party insights that you can have in your own toolkit. Because as we know a lot, I think what stops a lot of people from becoming effective in segmenting their audience is that they don't, they don't know where to start. Um, I think that's probably a good place to, to pause and, and kind of pop into the platform. This is obviously 
what we do all day long and <laughs> what Alex does especially. Um, so to pop into the platform and, and, and Alex, maybe you'll take a minute to, um, to kind of get under the hood of the car, so to speak, to kind of bring this to life. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I switched over to the platform. Um, so what you're seeing is the audience section, and which is what Lucy's been talking about and chatting about this whole time. So we always say that audience is sort of the heart of CrowdScout. And you know, once you get all your data into CrowdScout, how do you effectively target on your audience? So as you can see on the left-hand side, there's a bunch of different ways to start targeting on your audience. So whether that's activity data of how you've emailed them, maybe a lot of people aren't, you know, opening an email or clicking through an email or, you know, how well is my, are my ads doing, um, figuring out sort of which avenue um, and, and what buckets of audience you're trying to reach in different ways. So we always sort of start an audience and we always say that, it's, you know, it's the heart of CrowdScout. So being able to go into an activity and really click any of these activities and say, you know, show me all the people that I've opened an email um, or that I've sent an email um, for that I've also opened that email you know show me all those people and we start narrowing down our audience you know into smaller buckets being able to say of those people you know show me all those people who you know have also come to my website and maybe you know I want to know of those people who have come off an ad so being able to get really granular and how you're targeting and how you're reaching your audience is truly what's important and really how you can learn to be effective um, you know, and if I click into any of these profiles here, as Lucy was talking about, you know, every touch point you're having with um, your audience is equally as important. So figuring out, you know, maybe for this person, our best method of outreach has been, you know, they've cut, they've, you know, received an email, they open it, they click it, they come to our website. So maybe their best method of outreach is an email. Um, and so being able to sort of iterate and, and figure out what those buckets are. Um, for your organization and, and for your data set is truly important. That's actually, I think, a thing that I love about our platform that, you know, I often say that the thing that was missing in my former career as an advocacy practitioner was CrowdScout. And, and obviously I'm biased, but that ability to go down and actually look at what's happening with people, whether it's an audience of three or 300,000. And, and I think when you were in profiles just now, that's exactly what you were saying, um, that, that ability to really see who your folks are, even when, you know, you're just beginning a relationship with them. And, and I use that term loosely to mean when you were first starting to identify them, but being able to track their interactions with you before you'd even ID them so that you can say, Absolutely. Hey, who is this person? You know, do they respond to ads about this kind of content? Do they add you know, respond to contents about something else. I think that that's super valuable, Alex. Yeah. And even when you're, you know, you're segmenting on your audience and you have this smaller data set, as Lucy mentioned, you know, you have, you know, people coming into your website constantly and filling out web forms and, you know, contacting you in various ways. So for you to be able to figure out, you know, how do I, you know, figure out who this audience and how I'm interacting on them, both online and offline, seeking those up and, you know, really getting a more holistic view of your audience. That's really the nitty gritty and, and what's really crucial about audience. I just saw Alex that um, someone asked a question. It's, it's pretty CrowdScout specific, actually, but they just said, how the heck do you get all this activity data into your platform? Um, so that's a, great, that's that? a great question. Yeah, absolutely. So um, all your online data, uh, whether it's, you know, everything from ad clicks to page views to video views, all that comes in through tracking code. So as soon as you put our tracking code on your website, we can start picking up every interaction that you're having or that your users are having on your on your um, online platform. So, you know, from the second that they come onto your website to every single page they view, every video they watch, every form they fill out, we're able to collect all that information. Um, whether you're using, you know, our native CrowdScout email tool um, or you're using a third party tool, being able to feed all of the data and all the interactions that you're having online and offline um, all sync up and marry into CrowdScout. Um, so even when you know when you're going out to a meeting or you're going to an event, being able to record all of those interactions that you're having in CrowdScout and being able to marry them up with online interactions. So being able to say, wow, this is really awesome. Someone came to my website and wanted to learn more and then they attended an event and I just had a meeting with them and being able to visualize what that means for you and, and being able to figure out your next, you know, method of outreach is, is exactly what we're all about and what segmenting is really for. Cool. Awesome. Some, something else I just saw come through was, is there an ideal number of data points you should be segmenting on? Not always. I think that really varies by, yeah. by customer. Um, I think that if you're in a situation where it, it, you really have to think about what the scope of this issue is. So, um, you know, I think that that often comes from starting out your outreach campaign with a, a broad sense of the, the kind of, um, 
the village green, so to speak. So for instance, you know, we have a, a customer who used CrowdScout um, in a campaign um, in a couple of states and they were basically really, they were, they were working on an issue that had to do with a potential piece of legislation that they thought might get introduced, that they actually were really keen to see not be introduced because it, it was against their legislative agenda. And so in that case, they actually did a lot of um, focus grouping and, and learned a lot about kind of what made someone a limiter. So small um, demographic factors um, that, that were meaningful to them. There was a lot of differentiation between, um, say, someone in the 18 to 22 sector in terms of how they felt about an issue versus several other demographic groups. And so in that um, scenario, and, and because it became such a um, nitty gritty issue, they actually probably were working with um, probably 12 to 15 data points day in and day out. But when you think about that, even that is a relatively small number. Um, you know, obviously CrowdScout stores and can store thousands of data yeah. points about people and, and that's really valuable. But I think that one of the best tools that we've given our customers is the ability to store tags and custom attributes that they Absolutely. create themselves. Absolutely. Yeah, so to Lucy's point, you know, a lot of our customers use these tags to sort of drill down even further on their audience to be able to, you know, tag them in specific ways. And we sort of call those custom attributes in, in CrowdScout. And so to be able to say, you know, of all of, I'm just going to, you know, start from the top, but, you know, of all of, you know, my donors, tell me, you know, my donor type. So, you know, whether it's corporate or foundation or individual. So show me all of those people and let me drill down on that smaller data set of that larger data set to really, you know, target them differently. So to be able to really tag your audience and create, you know, um, you know, all these different, um, you know, touch points that you're having with your audience down to the nitty gritty is, is really important and really specific to your organization too. So, you know, what you're, what you're doing, what your efforts are, Maybe totally different than another customer of ours, but that doesn't, you know, and, and so this custom attribute value here, it really allows you to sort of get down to the nitty gritty and, and customize how you view your audience and, you know, the questions you're asking and how you're tagging them. Even down to the category itself. Right. Um, so exactly. to, for folks watching, this is the ability to build out audiences that are completely dictated by things that matter to you. So for instance, in this example of this field that Alex just pull, pulled up, donor type might have several values and, and it might be different for mm -hmm. you. So this would be, you know, what donor type might look like for a traditional, you know, urban um, nonprofit, whether folks are, you know, people who give money off of gala attendance or whether they're foundation givers. Um, but if you were, um, I, I don't know, this is off the top of my head, but like, let's say that you were a, a, a 4-H or farming community group um, using CrowdScout, your donor type might be totally different. It might be like um, people who um, uh, give, um, you know, livestock yeah. or for auction, or you might have just completely different fields. And, and I think that goes back to something that we see about the space in general, that challenges we see facing, um, groups trying to move issues is that they're often using tools that are built for something really different. They're using a tool set that is built for like a traditional sales leads or um, um, tr people trying to sell widgets. And when you're trying to sell hearts and minds, that customer journey is so unique to um, the, the kind of ins and outs of, of that issue itself. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we also, you know, you, and, and like Lucy said, you know, being able to really customize and individualize how you're working with CrowdScout is really important. So being able to create as many tags as you want and custom attributes as you want. Um, we allow our customers to have a whole tab of a profile to sort of customize it themselves to really, you know, drill down it and get to the nitty gritty of their initiatives. Yeah. Awesome. So I think we'll pop back into my slides for a minute. I think we should just kind of keep um, plowing through. Um, we won't take up too much of people's time, but I think that the, the next thing that, that we talk about a lot is that often, as, as we've talked about repeatedly throughout this, it's hard for people to know how to make this type of outreach manageable. Um, and this goes back to what we've been saying, but I think that often people, and in fact, um, you know, a, a, a practitioner recently said this, he said, I feel like a lot of times campaigns or nonprofits that are trying to move issues, they begin to have way too many buckets, right? Mm -hmm. So they're like, you know, I'm working in a congressional district. There, you know, I have an audience of 130,000 people and um, I have, you know, the 
the French neighborhood and I have the Knights of Columbus and I have the Rotary Club people and I have the soccer moms and I need to start tailoring messages for each and every one of those groups. And that's a really surefire way to become super overwhelmed by your own outreach strategy. Um, so while I think that is a great thing to do if you have the resources, I think, and I don't know if you find this, Alex, I think you probably do, that in some cases an audience might not matter to what you're moving at that moment. Right. And if they don't, you should not waste resources that you don't have time to discover. So, you know, really being able um, to figure out, you know, who is the the people, who is the audience of people who would be with me, but for this, right. that's the audience that you really don't focus on building out um, unique and tailored messages to. Um, and then I, I think that the other thing that often people um, forget, and this is, this is part of why I often say, you know, we want our customers to be playing the long game in their data-driven outreach strategy, is that people win an election or they um, get through a steep legislative fight or they get through a big fundraising period and then they stop talking to their audiences. Yeah. I, I think that's a kind of one of the pitfalls of the advocacy and outreach space that that doesn't face, um, you know, consumer side folks so much because Coca-Cola is trying to sell you Coke Zero, or I guess now Coke Zero sugar, sure. <laughs> every single day. Um, whereas we often only go to the trough when we want something from our audiences. And that means that the data itself becomes really outdated and um, is not uh, is not very, is not clean data really any more to use. So continuing that active engagement frequently and that active engagement um, without fatiguing your audiences is a smart thing to do because it allows you to test and really see, okay, well that, um, that didn't perform well with that group. And so, so actually the kind of the quiet times when you come up for air and when you don't have a live campaign going um, for folks in the advocacy space, that's actually a really great time to use to, to learn more about your audiences. Um, and then I, th I think by the same token, I mean, making data visualization really central to your outreach efforts is just really key. I mean, we know that outreach operations that make data viz a central part of their workflows are much more successful in generating conversions for those who Absolutely. don't. And, and then this is, I think, a challenge that is faced a lot by folks in the advocacy and campaign space. Um, you know, sometimes it's hard to get buy-in from higher-ups in your organization. Um, and so using data vis visualization, you know, something as simple as throwing up a Crowd Scout dashboard and yeah. saying to your um, executive director or campaign manager, hey, do you mind logging in and taking a look at this, um, is a good way to show that you're on track as you as you try to visualize some of those, those segments. So I actually think it might make sense to pop back into the platform and, and kind of chat about these things a little bit as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, to Lucy's point, every time you log into the platform, you see this dashboard here. And, and a huge reason for that is exactly what Lucy was touching on. It's the ability to sort of see your ongoing interactions and even in the off cycle or when you're really getting, you know, you know, down to, um, you know, a deadline, you need to figure out, you know, what's going on and to be able to visualize that audience right when you log into the platform. And, and even for your higher ups, as, as Lucy was saying, you know, being able for them every time they log in to see exactly what they want to see every time is, is really important. So, you know, we created a couple of modules here. And as you can see, you know, you can really get down to the nitty gritty of your audience. Um, so you build charts and goals through our analysis suite and you can really chart on any data point that you have in the, on the platform. So, you know, even though your data set is really small, all the online interactions and the offline interactions you're having actually accumulate to a lot. So, you know, a couple of these would be, you know, show me all the people that came off of ads that then filled out forms because, you know, you want to outreach them in different ways. Maybe some of them want to continue to follow up on the content you're creating and others want to learn how to get more involved. So being able to track all those visualizations and then be able to start seeing, you know, how many form submissions you're getting daily or weekly is really, really important. So as we sort of go down the line, you'll see a couple of different interactions. You can see all your email stats or a, demo, or a simple, you know, demographic breakdown or even digital stats. You know, how is you know, you know, how many website visitors am I getting every single day and being able to also create goals. So being able to, you know, set goals, I need to, you know, have a hundred phone calls done by this person by the end of the week and being able to track that. So, you know, for your higher ups, being able to log in and seeing every interaction and touch point you're having and for them to be able to track that in a really simplistic way. Um, is all available and accessible through, you know, the dashboard and also the ability to create multiple dashboards. So maybe the efforts that you're running day to day aren't that applicable to your higher up, but your higher up when they log in need to see something specific. So being able to build out multiple and 
dashboards and manage those dashboards. So you're, you know, across your organization for every department, maybe, you know, you have a different dashboard because you're all working towards the same goal, but maybe your efforts are different. Um, and so being able to, you know, visualize your audience that way. Yeah, and likewise, on another use case for the multiple dashboard um, visualization of segments, I think, is is so many groups who are working on so many issues at one time. So, you know, whether it's that you're working in multiple states and you want to toggle between state dashboards because it may be the, a demographic or a segment of your audience that um, is really key for you in Arkansas is different from the one in Nebraska. Um, so being able to talk, toggle through dashboards that way, I think, is can be really effective. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that, um, you know, as we as we keep talking about this, we, we really always want to come back to why this makes people so effective. Um, so, you know, really being able to show the value in that segmenting. And yeah. I think it really comes down to the results that you'll see. Um, you know, people are almost 44% more likely to give over their information, um, you know, when a message is personalized, even if it's an unknown brand. Um, you know, someone just said, what ways does CrowdScout help me identify abnormalities or interesting details about my out audience or outreach efforts? Um, let me read that one more time. Let me repeat that. I said that fast. What ways does CrowdScout help me identify abnormalities or interesting details about my audience or outreach efforts? I would say probably it would come back to visualization. Absolutely. Um, so being able to, you know, look at returns um, might be a good chance. Actually, Alex, we might hop into segmenting one more time, but, but you know, really being able to go in and drill down in that, in that activity area where we were before, but really being able to drill down on interactions. So, um, you know, maybe I want to look at how someone responded to a form and I want to look at, um, you know, a certain audience. Um, I want to look at, um, we won't build this, but I've, I've built a demographic baseline of, of people, you know, people, likely voters or something. And I want to drill down on, you know, women in a certain area who answered a quiz or survey a certain way. Um, so maybe they said they weren't sure that they were going to vote, right? So you could say, um, I want to, uh, I'm, this is off the cuff, but maybe you're saying, I want to look at audiences who are, who have said that when Canvas 2 or when Survey Digitally, who said that they are not sure if they are going to vote this cycle. And then I'm going to, I want to see who they are demographically. And maybe you find that um, actually in your area, only 30% of married women who you surveyed say that, say that they think they're going to vote this cycle, but that's really well below what you would normally expect from that demographic of your audience. So you'd want to go in and build out the audience. And, and so we'd, we'd do that. And then you'd go back into your dashboard. We could even save this criteria. And we've now, um, you know, this is a, and we'd go right back into our dashboard and we'd pull that segment right into, um, into our dashboard. So we'd go in here, back to dashboard. Um, you know, we could start to create a chart and we'd go through the process of vi visualizing this very audience in terms of in that outcome. Um, so we won't belabor this, but you know, go in and say, show me the money, you pick the chart. Um, and then, you know, CrowdScout is giving you ways to really visualize this throughout. So, um, you know, you can click that you want to see a certain demographic statistic about people who answered that way, or maybe you want to, you know, look at the digital presence of people who've been surveyed and answered a certain way. Um, you know, obviously, CrowdScout, I, I was evangelizing, um, focusing on your first party data, but CrowdScout does also auto append some really helpful baseline data. You know, we're always um, trying to append social profiles, we're appending um, FEC data where relevant to folks. So, you know, you can really um, plug and play from a variety of different data points. Um, but after that, you know, we'd go ahead and we'd continue to build our chart. We would pick um, measurement, we could pick what kind of chart we wanted to see. Um, and after that, we could look at a, a whole range of things, you know, um, get, you can get really detailed, obviously, like the email behavior of a certain demographic group in this, in this area. Um, once you've built your chart, and I should, I should add that when you're in your dashboard, you can, as Alex was getting at, you can add the chart right there. You can also add a lot of other kinds of modules. You know, if you really, what you really want to do is add a goal, like I want to, door knock to those women who've said they're not sure they're going to come out to vote right now. Um, you know, you could go ahead and, and start to add goals this way. Maybe it's, 
I want to add a goal of donations among a certain industry or audience, excuse me. And you just go ahead and add those to dashboards. So all the time, you know, we're helping to give you better ways to keep your eyes on the prize with those folks. I should add, this is like kind of silly, Alex, but you know, one of my favorite parts of CrowdScout is the ability literally <laughs> to move things around. Um, but, um, but so that's a, a super key part of, part of that. I yeah, think. absolutely. And to go back to Lucy's point and to just touch back, to, back into audience for a minute, you know, being able to visualize your audience, as Lucy said, is super important and being able to, you know, when you have those ab abnormalities and, and you start drilling down on your audience, being able to visualize that audience as you're going down. So, you know, if you want to say, show me all the people I've sent an email to, um, you know, and, and being able to, you know, view high level stats of that audience as you create them. So we find that our customers a lot of the time need to figure out and need to find this special audience of, you know, a, a certain demographic or, you know, making sure that if we're going to do a phone effort that we have landlines for those people. Um, so being able to both, you know, segment on your audience and then also visualize your audience, whether you're done and you go into analysis and create that module or, you know, if, if you're playing around with your audience trying to figure out what your sweet spot is today. Um, so being able to sort of toggle back and forth is also super important and, and really useful for a lot of our customers and, and the work they're doing in CrowdScout. Absolutely. Um, Scott just told me that one, someone else had asked, um, how do you drill down on insights from the third party tools you're using? Um, sure. Whether it's an Eventbrite or a MailChimp um, and, and Alex can run through it. It'll be much the same way as, as we've, it's, we try to really make those things seamless. Absolutely. We do. And so we, tr we really pride ourselves in, you know, being able to connect to any third party tool and being able to drill down on it the way you would drill down on it if you had used our native tools. So say for instance, you're using MailChimp for your email efforts or Eventbrite for your, you know, event registration efforts. So being able to click email send, whether you've sent that through the CrowdScout platform or whether you've sent that through a third party platform. So being able to click, you know, email send down here and saying service used, and you can say CrowdScout. And if you were using MailChimp, MailChimp would also be here. Um, so being able to drill down on your audience, whether you're using in-house tools or a mixture of both, um, is really important to us. So you, the way you would do that is you would go to email send or, you know, if you're clicked to event, right, you know, you'd still click that event because that interaction is always the same, whether you're doing it through CrowdScout or not. Um, so we want to make sure that, you know, everything looks cohesive and, and as if it had happened in the platform. I'm glad that someone asked that question because it really gets to the crux of why CrowdScout is value add for so many folks that right. people have all these outreach tools and they say, my data isn't talking to each other. So, you know, they might have a really, really robust email list, but they don't know who on that email list is a likely voter or they don't know who among those voters is also, um, you know, someone who is likely to uh, be responsive to canvassing um, and so on and so forth. So I think that ability to bring those things together so that you can build out an audience of people who are likely voters who opened an email an hour ago, watched a video, but not to completion and, you know, were served an ad and came in off of XYZ yeah. UCM tag and gave this donation. I mean, you know, back to the question earlier about how many data points do you segment on? If you're segmenting on your own data, the more you're segmenting on and the more interactions that you're segmenting on, the better, I think, in, in, serving, in serving those audiences. Um, but, you know, really to come back for how the value add of um, effective segmenting and targeting strategy, it really comes down to results. Um, you know, I mentioned that people are more likely to give over their information, and we all know that conversions are gold to people who are doing data-driven outreach. Um, but, but also, you know, audiences are twice as likely to click through content that's personalized, even if it is from an unknown brand. And, you know, when we say unknown brand, we don't mean toilet paper. It could mean toilet paper, actually. But it, it really means your brand, your campaign's brand, the issue that is your cause but isn't someone else's cause um, yet. And so, you know, this, the stats are true that marketing pros, campaign pros who are investing in personalized content, they're seeing double-digit returns in, in conversion. And so, you know, I think, you know, we're, we're almost out of time here, but but to close, I, I think that, you know, hopefully we've given you a little snapshot of, of why um, audience segmentation is, is so crucial to that work. So to, to many more webinars, um, I, I hope that was value to folks, valuable, excuse me. And, um, you know, of course, we have a, an entire dedicated customer success team here at CrowdScout that, that can work with our customers on best practices. We have a lot of great content on our blog, um, and we're actually unveiling um, some more in the next yeah. few weeks. Um, so we're 
excited about that. But, but in general, um, you know, send us feedback about this. Let us know um, if you want more webinars like this. Please send us um, topics you're interested in. Um, you know, we're really interested as we expand our webinar program to include practitioners who are out in the field like you all every day, moving issues. Um, so, so please send us your feedback, and um, we hope that you enjoyed this webinar today. Many thanks for, for joining us. As a quick housekeeping item, this will be available um, as a recording and um, we'll make sure to send that to you all as well. So thank you for joining us.